Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Katleho Ramanzima, and I am a researcher here at the Institute for Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies. Thank you all for tuning in. Today, we'll be discussing the release of state land. On the 1st of October, Minister Togo Didiza announced that 700,000 hectares of state land will be released to be leased by farm beneficiaries for uh, agricultural purposes. The president's weekly letter to the public followed this on Wednesday, the 6th of October, affirming the redistribution of state land to black farm beneficiaries. At the same time, many are curious and want to know more as land reform was put on halt since lockdown. And other relevant key debates tied to land, such as food security, dominated the sector. Finally, something is beginning to happen. Should we be excited about this? Could the Tumamina moment be upon us, as the president did say in his national address in February this year, that state land will be released for agricultural purposes? Or could the announcement be some form of window dressing by the up for the upcoming uh, election, as some may suggest. If not, then what could the redistribution of state land actually mean, and who will get it, and how? Sapa Fukane, a social sciences researcher working with issues affecting former boundary stands at the Alliance for Rural Democracy, ARD for in short, together with our very own Ruth Hall, are joining me today to help us understand the announcement better and its implications on rural South Africa and South Africa in general. Welcome to you both. Please do not forget to tweet about the webinar. Our Twitter handle is hashtag land reform as demonstrated on the bottom of your screens. Now, without wasting any more time, my first question goes to you, Ruth. This was a very important announcement made by Minister Didiza, uh, as it demonstrates that some effort by government um, to avail land to farmers who needed who needed it. But what do we know about this state land uh, that is being released and where is it exactly and is it of good value? Ruth? Thanks so much, Katlejo. Um, there's such big questions. Um, and the most important thing that I want to start with is that we know almost nothing about it. And I think that that's actually really important and quite worrying. Uh, I think that uh, in any land reform process, uh, what land is being made available and who's going to get it are going to be two of the most important questions. And we don't know much about this land. Uh, I would like to, um, to share with you and viewers just for a moment. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Are you able to see my screen? Mm, perhaps this isn't Not working. Yet, but yes, it's working. We are able to. Oh, it is. Oh, okay, just yes. as a slight play. Okay. But I thought it was worth uh, sharing um, some of the actual statistics. So, what uh, the minister announced exactly a week ago, it was Thursday last week on the 1st of October, is that government is planning to what she calls release. And I think we must look at this word release. But she said we're going to, that government will release about 700,000 hectares of land. Um, and uh, this is constituted of 896 uh, farms. So the words farms and release tells us quite a, while, quite a bit. I'll get into that. But here are the statistics um, are broken down by province. And I think that this is quite revealing. So, you know, it doesn't tell us where within those provinces, but it does show us, if you look carefully, very important first takeaway I take is, in my view, in the past six months or so, we have faced a sort of a heightening of a land crisis in South Africa and it's linked to the COVID lockdown. So while there's a long-term demand for land and people across the country wanting land for various purposes, I think that uh, in the context of the lockdown, many backyard shack dwellers being evicted, there's been a huge urban and peri-urban land crisis. And yet what we see is that the state land that is being released, there's nothing in Gauteng and nothing in the Western Cape. Another thing that's worth 
focusing on is that the most significant areas of allocation are in Limpopo and the Northwest. Very little in the Free State and in KZN and smaller amounts in the Eastern Cape, um, Mpumalanga and Northern Cape. And, you know, um, I suppose many people think, how is it that a government after about a quarter of a century of democracy suddenly finds an area of 700,000 hectares? It's a large amount. Uh, a hectare is like two large football fields. So if we're just thinking 700,000 is a lot. Uh, so where is this land coming from and why wasn't it identified before? And how, how is it suddenly available for redistribution? Um, and I think that the provinces give us a bit of a clue uh, I think that, uh, you know, these are defined as farms, in which case they're formally surveyed and titled. Um, my view is that the provinces suggest that these are areas that are in provinces that had former Bantu stands, areas uh, where there were homelands. These are not areas within the homelands. They're privately titled farms. But I suspect, and I would love to hear, uh, Tsepo, your view on this, that, you know, there was a large area, large areas of land were bought, particularly during the 1970s, for homeland consolidation uh, from white farmers. Black farmers were allocated these farms. Um, and, uh, and that tenure system was never formalized. Uh, my sense is that we may be looking at land uh, that was already acquired decades ago for homeland consolidation. I'm not sure. It's one of the questions we should be asking. Thank you very much, Ruth, for that. Tepo, you work with people in the communal areas, and the majority of the poor farmers in those communities have been underrepresented in land reform processes. This includes other social groups, such as women, the youth, the landless, farm workers, and dwellers. Do you think that since the state since state land will be redistributed in uh, the homelands, will it benefit the majority of, of those communities? Thank you so much, um, Katleho. I think it's fascinating, your question and also Ruth's um, suspicion or observation. And it's not happening in a vacuum. I think it's because we know historically what had happened, that there are large tracts of land in particular provinces that were never consolidated. Now, what has happened since is there were lots of black farmers on that land, but their tenure system, just like Ruth is saying, was not um, secure. The, the, the challenge now is also, if it means it's some of those types of farms, are they vacant? Are there no occupants there? Are there no people currently residing or using the land or having any kind of rights in land there? These are the things that also are weighing on our mind. As the ARD, our priority and our desire is to see more people who have a need for agricultural land accessing it, being able to use it. But that should not happen at the expense of land reform as a large program or at the expense of any of the other rights holders on these types of farms. We have seen the types of conflicts that come because you've got a farmer, even if it's a black farmer, and there are occupants or farm workers, and they disagree day to day. Now, what ends up happening is that you find some categories of the rights holders having more power, privilege, you know, um, social capital, financial capital. So they, they're in a position to kind of call the shots at the expense of other land users. Now, what we also know from our experiences in the communal areas is that there are people who are in conflict almost daily. Um, just last week, we were in uh, Bushbuck Ridge. We were meeting with uh, Setare Traditional Council, with Department of Cocteau and Rural Development as well, over disputes around land allocations. So in communal areas, you've got communal farmers. Maybe they're grazing their livestock or they're plowing. And they are constantly being advised that there isn't enough land to meet all of the land users' needs. So we can't accommodate large numbers of livestock herds in a village, and we can't have every household plowing a certain number of hectares. So it means that within the communal areas, it's not just a free-for-all. There are people who have a big need for land for agricultural purposes that are struggling to access it. And now when we hear 
a positive thing that excites us that there'll be land getting released. It is lots of question marks to say, where was it all along? How long has the state held this land? And how did it determine that it should be now leased for um, agricultural purposes? Were there no existing or pre-existing land users, rights holders, and most importantly, claims? There may actually be restitution claims on that land. There may be claims under the Labor Tenants Act on some of those farms. There may even be um, people who would have qualified under ESTA to be able to um, access some kind of a subsidy for, you know, um, is it under Section 4 of ESTA? So that's um, Extension of Security of Tenure Act. So for the occupants, long-term um, occupants on farms who needed to um, have their tenure strengthened. So there's many, many questions about this land and this approach. Also, um, where I suppose our discussion will continue, but if it's going to be quite district-based, uh, we should know the districts, like Ruth's question, um, and we should have a lot more information, but I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Tepo. You touch on a very important area, and it's uh, restitution. Now, the statement made by the minister, and this question also goes to you, um, acknowledges that about 360 hect uh, hectares were identified through the state land analysis uh, to be under claim, equating to 413 properties. 43,000 uh, hectares were equating to about um, 60 properties are new order claims. And this process has been uh, interdicted by the Constitutional Court. Now, one may argue that this does not give sufficient information as to which parts of these lands uh, to, uh, are to be redistributed. Do you think that it would have been imperative for the state to consider land, re land restitution before claiming the release of state land? Absolutely, Katler, because there are claims, some of which have not even seen the inside of a courtroom or the officials. The last thing people got from December 1998 was just a KRP. Some of the claims are stagnant. Some of them were wrongly um, finalized. Some are embedded. There's conflicts. So there is absolutely a need to pause. If there is, in fact, state land that is vacant, let's assume, not got uh, occupiers or users right now. It is so important to consider that there's restitution claims paused, waiting to, you know, be finalized, dot, dot, dot. There's also the same restitution category. There's people who are going to need alternative land. Imagine the state going to purchase when it's already sitting on great um, arable agricultural land. That's why we want to see a land reform that's integrated. We talk of redistribution, yes, but we mustn't operate in a vacuum. Tenure and restitution are so essential. Land administration, land governance. I think, Gadejo, as Ruth has highlighted, these yeah. things are going to intermix uh, and overlap these issues because we're not just talking about a farm that appeared from nowhere. Absolutely. Um, Tepo, I do agree with you that we shouldn't actually consider these issues in isolation, which is pretty much what the government is currently doing. Um, Ruth, I would like to ask you about um, how significant is this land area when compared to the land redistributed per annum? And are government targets and public expectations aligned? Thanks so much. Um, uh, if we can just bring up um, my current graph, um, can you see that? Can you confirm if you can see that? Not yet. Okay, it's coming. So I'll tell you if it's a lot or a little. Many people want to say, okay, 700,000 hectares, is it a lot or a little? And the answer in short is that um, it is quite a lot compared to how much land has been redistributed in most years uh, since, uh, since 1994. Can you see my graph now? Are you able to see the graph? 
Okay. Um, we well, sorry? Perhaps we can try again. Okay. Um, well, we can in a moment, but I want to say that in the um, in the past 25 years or something, uh, the allocation of land through redistribution has fluctuated actually quite a lot. And the high point uh, was around 2007, 2008 at about half a million, about 500,000 hectares redistributed in, the, in, the, in that year. Um, and what's happened over time is that uh, there's been a decline. And right now, I would say that the 700,000 is like 10 years worth of land redistribution. So government has been redistributing around 190, uh, last year, 84,000 hectares in an entire financial year. So compared to that, 700,000 is like 10 years worth of redistribution happening all in one year. And it's all state land compared to most redistribution, which has been the redistribution of privately owned land. Uh, if somebody can confirm that you can see my graph, I want to show you something pretty interesting. Uh, can you confirm that? Uh, no. Um... Oh, dear. oh dear. Oh, what a pity! Because I um I created nice. Maybe we can make um uh, some of these uh, visuals available on the Plus website at some point. Um, but for now, what I would say is that. Uh, the high point of land redistribution was at actually the end of the Mbeki era, around 2007. It's been declining. Okay, we're sorry to disturb you. We can now see your graphs. We can now okay. see your graphs. Super. Yeah. So here's the fun one, uh, which is just to show you this is what land redistribution has looked like over time. Uh, apologies to Zapiro. Um, uh, and uh, so what we're talking about is. Uh, this decline in redistribution that we've seen over time, uh, this 700,000 hectares is well above even the high point of around about the Polokwane conference. Some people will remember that we were promised that land reform would speed up, but um, the opposite happened. So I think that by, by any measure, this is a large amount of land. But I think that uh, Tsepo has raised important questions about um, not just um, which land, is it good, is it a lot? Uh, but who are the people who might have prior claims uh, and, uh, and indeed rights to this land? So if we go back to the historical maps, we know that the reserves of, of 1913 of the Natives Land Act set aside around 7% of the land. And in 1936, the Natives Trust and Land Act expanded that to around 13%. And over many years, this process of homeland consolidation happened. In fact, from the early 70s, most of the homelands were in many, many fractures little portions of land, but put at Swana by the early 70s uh, was 19 pieces, separate pieces. And by the time it got independence in 77, it was amalgamated into nine through the purchase and sometimes expropriation of white owned land. This is a massive process of social engineering. So it means that around many of these provinces, there are privately titled farms that are state owned and they're owned by national government. I think this is important to remember. So here were the forced movements of people in and out and around these areas. Of course, there are black spot removals. People like Cus Main, who Charles von Onselen has, has written about extensively, was one of the people who was moved over many years uh, uh, in that process and ended up, uh, sorry, I'll just get out of this, and ended up um, in in one of these areas with the consolidation of of the homeland so what i would say here is there are many questions but i think that the actual current status of the of the the land its history who's on it who has rights to it is absolutely central i'm deeply worried about the process that has been proposed which is that um there will be advertising uh, of these farms, people will be eligible to apply. They will have to go and attend a day where they can inspect the farms and then put in written applications. In my view, this is an absolute abrogation of what um, equitable access to land is meant to look like. Uh, the constitution says that um, access to land on an equitable basis is the right of every citizen. We don't have framework legislation. The Motlante panel in 2017 said there must be a law that says, how do we access uh, this right of equitable access? Uh, and part of what it did is it suggested a, a framework law nationally that would uh, ensure that 
all government planning takes into account people's land needs, whether for agriculture or housing or whatever, and that there's a coordinated response and that that whole process is transparent, uh, it's um, open to public scrutiny, and that it's fair in the sense that it doesn't treat everyone equally, it, but it must be equitable, which means that those who have the greatest need for land are prioritized. Ever since 2017, this has been reiterated. Uh, the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform told uh, government's interministerial committee on land reform in 2018 that it was working on such a thing. The presidential advisory panel that I was part of in 2018 to 2019 called for precisely this kind of law and called for a reform of the whole process that we that we use. It called for democratic, participatory, open local processes uh, linked in with IDP planning. So I think that there's a real concern if we go ahead with the distribution on long-term leases, by the way, um, of large areas of land to private individuals outside of any such system. Um, in a sense, it's like using a tender type of process uh, to deal with a human right. And I don't think we have the frameworks in place. Thank you very much, Ruth, for that. Um, but I still have a question for Tepo. Um, Tepo, as Ruth has highlighted, the bulk of this land, and it's also in the minister's statement, will be that will be redistributed is in the Limpopo and Northwest um, uh, 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 provinces. What are your concerns about Thanks, it? Thanks, Katar. Um, let me start with knowing that we've got a large number of labor tenant claims in our country that actually led to the long process of the Concord finally saying we need a special master to adjudicate and to assist because we also know one of the things that happened, the department lost tens of thousands of claims, right? People have also moved over the years. So I, that's why I, I have a question mark about a province like Limpopo. We know that there's claims there. They just won't be the, 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 the documentation that you would need. We also imagine the restitution claims there in the two provinces. We also imagine um, that on state land, um, they may have been, let's say, mining or other land-based investments and I'm thinking of those two provinces because this is happening currently in communal areas, in the land that is communally owned, but being administered by the traditional authorities, um, which is also still state owned in that sense. So there are some serious questions about the where and the who and the why. And it's, um, I think even drawing from, uh, not to be premature, but just drawing from some people's comments around how, um, the, the, the way that people were moved to create these farms has also meant that there'll be subsequent, you know, claims. So there'll be layers of claimants, I think. And um, the provinces that are earmarked, are qu there's big question marks about the numbers of hectares and how does it happen that uh, uh, in a place where people are clamoring for land for agricultural purposes, the state is using this mechanism instead of considering all the people who have formed cooperatives and are struggling to access more land to be able to either expand, sustain themselves, any number of, of reasons for wanting the agricultural land. So I think realizing that a province like Gauteng and Western Cape are not earmarked for the next um, phase of redistributing, you know, the 700,000 uh, hectares means then this is not, like Ruth was saying, the redistribution of commercial land. It's state-owned. And I think it was even in the president's um, Monday, you know, address to us to say, I think we're, we're only averaging since 1994, something like 10% of commercial land was being redistributed. The rest we see um, was actually held by the state initially. So the provinces also gives us concerns because we know about the types of challenges and violations that people are encountering in those areas. 
Thank you very much, Sebo. Um, my next question is also for you, Ruth. Uh, the issue around budget is imperative in land redistribution processes. Or uh, how else would the government uh, be able to fund recapitalization, offer post settlement support, offer training, and other farming needs as it has listed? Do you think that the mm. government is financially prepared for redistribution in the next coming uh, weeks? Yeah, uh, thanks so much. Uh, you know, um, Katleho, the budgets for land reform um, have never been above 1% of the national budget, um, and they've been in decline uh, also for just over a decade, in real terms dropping to about a third of what they were 12 years ago. But what's imp also important is that the budgets, even this year, in the supplementary budget that was adopted, um, was it in June, um, uh, actually cut all the food security budgets that are associated with uh, both training, infrastructure development, support and extension for small scale farmers. So it's not only the capital budgets for acquiring privately owned land that have been reduced, but also the budgets for um, all the agricultural support for people to use this. Um, of course, this is in a bigger context. We, we need to acknowledge that this is in the context of the past few decades uh, of dismantling many of the systems that uh, supported white agriculture. Um, so, I mean, I would emphasize that both the budgets for land reform and restitution have been declining, um, but I think that it's not only a budget issue. Um, I think that uh, I think that there are wider questions about what kind of agriculture is being set up. Of course, that's a big debate. Perhaps it, it's for another day. But there, there are two other issues that I want to uh, raise if it's okay with you. And the one is about um, state land versus private land. I know that there are many who argue that um, the state is such a big owner of land. Why doesn't it just redistribute its own land? Why should it target privately owned land? And it's always been very clear that most state land is used. It's in the Bantustan, the ex Bantustans, it's communal land, it's occupied and used, or it's um, uh, protected areas and not available for redistribution. So that's mostly state national state land. And indeed, this is land held by national government. But the state land audit that was done in 2013 shows us that, in fact, the really big and significant owners of, of, uh, of land are local government, local and provincial government. And particularly, one category of state land that we know far too little about is the parastatals parastatals, the state-owned enterprises. So we do need more information about that. And I think that if we start to get to how can state land be used strategically for land reform, indeed it should be, then what's still needed is a proper framework. Because uh, right now, most of the state land is held by the Department of Public Works and, and Infrastructure. And there, there needs to be a decision-making system that can identify here's the public land that can be used for, for public purposes to promote equitable access to land. A few weeks ago, we had a webinar dealing with the Tafelberg case in Cape Town, where uh, uh, provincial and local government agreed to sell prime land that could have and should have been used for affordable housing. So I think that there's a real problem if we have national government going ahead without engaging with local and provincial government about how they deal with their land. And a second point I want to make about state land in the land reform process is that while we, government used to assist people to buy land on the open market, privately owned land, and then transfer that title to the beneficiaries, this stopped. Um, it was stopped entirely by 2011 uh, by Minister Nquinti. And so ever since then, uh, land has been redistributed uh, via the state buying up land on the open market. We still have a willing buyer, willing seller, but now it's the state is the willing buyer. And it's retaining ownership and making that land available on a leasehold basis. Now, of course, when government buys land, it's uh, counting those hectares. But we must be careful that we're not uh, counting the land that's acquired and when it's allocated. So anyway, that's just to say that I think that we need to have a wider debate, not just about which land, who does it go to, and what kind of support do they have, but what kind of rights are people going to get to this land? And for now, what we know is that uh, the model that we're working with is a 30-year leasehold. Uh, Tsepo, I would be interested to hear your views from, from uh, the Alliance for Rural Democracy about uh, people's experience of living on state-owned land and how their rights are treated. 
Sure, Tepo, Tepo, would you quickly like to take us through that? Thanks, Katlejo. Um, these massive conflicts and challenges for people in communal areas, uh, and as much as the state, uh, maybe it will be provincial government, if it's the former Bantu stance who's holding the land, is the registered owner because of the system of saying it's a traditional authority who should administer. There's conflicts nonstop daily about allocation, land use, um, paying tribal levies, uh, having to pay for a proof of address when you are residing on a farm that is registered legally in the name of government, and yet you are paying some endless costs and fees to traditional councils, traditional authorities. Anytime you fail to do that, then there's threats of evictions. And what that means is that the, the protections you would assume are existing on state-owned land are actually absent in communal areas. Um, the informal, you know, land rights holders are constantly going up against developers, um, people coming who want to make investments, land-based deals. Um, and sometimes it's actually also the state who is saying that um, we've decided through uh, the IDB processes that this land is actually supposed to be uh, turned into a part of the SEZ, you know, the economic development zones. And that means that the users of that portion of land need now alternative land. And so living on state-owned land doesn't actually mean secure tenure, and it doesn't actually mean protection of rights. Thanks, Katlech. Thank you very much, Tepa. I mean, like, there's so many questions to this, more than answers. Um, but then what I would like us for us to discuss now shortly is the beneficiation, uh, beneficiary um, criteria. Now, uh, and this question goes to the both of you. The announcement made by the minister uh, has a very clear beneficiary selection criteria and it clearly stipulates the application process. For instance, it uh, lists commercial uh, and smallholder farmers with a turnover of about 50,000 to a million should be the right beneficiaries. It also prioritizes uh, women, the youth, and persons with disabilities to be able to benefit from, from this process. In your view, uh, and I will just say what I, I felt when I read this, I was worried, of course, why farm dwellers and farm workers are not uh, prioritized, for instance. And to me, it seemed as if like it's the same criteria that was used when uh, in the first phase of the proactive land acquisition strategy plus going short and there isn't uh, much of a difference although we have uh, sub made submissions to gazette for the change of 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 of, of the beneficiary selection policy in your view who should be getting the land on what terms what should be considered in these processes Any of you can go first. <laughs> can I start, Tepa? Ruth? Yeah. So I'm really excited about that because, like you're saying, Katja, we just started the year off giving uh, public comments on the draft policy for beneficiary um, selection and land allocation policy. Fine. We had serious worries because in that draft policy, there is a subsection that was saying uh, there's communities, uh, there's people living on state land and township residents and how in that uh, criteria they could apply. The worry is to say already there, that was our first um, indication that something is wrong because the policy was saying um, the land which is on the edge, you know, adjacent to the communal areas would be used for the de-densification of what decongestion of communal land. So now who would be living or, or who gets relocated or resettled if we are saying that that was something the policy had in mind as uh, beneficiaries? We don't have yet a finalized policy we have just the stipulations that the minister's given in terms of people's annual turnover or um, the amount of capital or collateral that they can raise. 
So already we know that the haves, the elites, the people who can uh, have access to data, social capital, the information, are able to understand and go through the application process will benefit. Chances are they will have proximity to people in power also, because if there's thousands of applicants, not all will be able to actually um, be successful and lease the land. And we've seen in the past what happened, which was that a lot of officials working, one, for government, and two, even for the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform, with the direct beneficiaries. They ended up managing to lease farms. When people ask questions to say, how does that work? Then it seemed that the policy allowed for um, state uh, employees to get land. So what it means is, if we think about where the land is, chances are someone like me in a city can just parachute from nowhere and now begin to lease the land because I have the resources. And yet people in communal areas who are grazing, plowing, coming into conflict, being told that they must reduce their stock herd, will literally watch land in front of them go to others. People who've got claims will watch other people just appear on the scene and be able to access and use the land before them. Um, people who have a number of needs for agricultural land, uh, who are poor, coming from rural areas, are going to be waiting in the in the queue. But who do you think is going to jump straight to the front? It's the people who have the means, the people with the info, the people with um, opportunity. So that's why it's a very big question to say, what is going to be happening here? Yeah. Absolutely, I totally agree. And you raise very important questions. Ruth, do you want to take this quickly? Or should we just move on to the audience for the interest of time? May I very quickly say, I think the point is that we shouldn't decide, nor should the minister decide who should get the land. It should be subject to a democratic and open process. That process hasn't been set out. Uh, it is a peculiarity of South Africa's land reform program that there is that we focus on uh, quite abstract uh, identity criteria, but actually what drives this is the idea that people must be able to show that they will use the land effectively. So what, what starts out is like the state uh, engaging in austerity, uh, shrinking budgets, but then requiring that you can show that you can be productive, is that it, it builds directly into uh, an elite bias within policy. That's that's how it works. And so I think that if we if we start from the point of view of saying we have a constitutional right of access to land on an equitable basis, we have no legal framing of that that says what people's rights are. There's no process for uh, democratic and open ways for people to identify their demands for land and to engage around that. Um, and, uh, you know, some years ago, I interviewed um, an official from the Department of Agriculture about how they decide how much money to give to whom uh, under yeah. the CAST program, Comprehensive Agricultural Support Program. And he said, he actually said, don't quote me, but I'm, I'm not mentioning his name, but he said, to be honest, it's like political smarties. We hand out political yeah. smarties. So I want to know what is the mechanism that will be used here to ensure that we're not doing political smarties. Absolutely. Thank you both for your uh, very insightful inputs. And I would like to also pose a question to our audience. Is this how we should be approaching the issue of land redistribution and land reform in general? But I will now take questions and comments from the audience and kindly be reminded that uh, you can tweet uh, and our Twitter handle is hashtag land reform as demonstrated on the bottom of your screens. Our first question is from Rudy Hillerman. I hope I pronounced that right. Will these farms have their prehistory informing and relating to potential land claims published? I really don't know. I mean, I suppose, in a sense, rather than um, us trying to answer what government is planning, firstly, mm -hmm. I think that um, 
questions of information should be reframed as um, as challenges to government to say, if this is to be done in a responsible way, if this is to be done in an equitable way and a democratic way, here's what you would need to do. So the first thing I think, and we could probably think of a sort of a wish list, maybe people in the comments want to suggest, but you know, I, I have several points. Um, firstly, you know, if this is to be done in an open and democratic way, and, and there's nothing wrong with making uh, state land available. Personally, I think that it somewhat deflects from the reality, which is that a lot of the really well located land that is needed for redistribution is privately owned. So we can't get away from that. Nonetheless, if uh, if publicly um, owned land is to be made available, we need to map it and make it known. Uh, what's the history? <laughs> what's the current status of it? Um, who else potentially has rights to it? Uh, why are we not focusing on people who are already there? We know that there has been a tendency of government to use what's called a use it or lose it principle and evict its own uh, occupiers. Um, so I think that that would be a starting point, but perhaps in the next 20 minutes, we can start to think of what are the things that would need to be done. Thank you very much. And I, I, uh, the next question is from Boa Monjane, and he's asking, did the minister say where those lands are lo located? Is it possible that it might be land given away by farmers as a result of pressure to expropriate without compensation? Well, I guess uh, the answer to um, uh, Boa Monjane is that uh, we, we, we do not know uh, to date as to where exactly that land is and what um, uh, the, the ministry has planned. And perhaps we will be able to uh, follow up on that within the next weeks as the, 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 the farms will be advertised. Um, next question, please. Can I make a, a comment? Okay, sure, Tepo, you can. Um, I think it's exactly what we need. Because we know that through, I think when the minister was giving us the process, it's that it will be an application. And one of the first point, parts is the district um, land reform committee, I think, would screen. So we need access to that kind of information to know which districts. It will tell us a lot which districts, which farms, before they are even um and it should be, I think, like you were saying, wouldn't it be better if we would have a process of gazetting and then having 30-day notice period for people who have a claim or a concern or a complaint before you even have the applications coming? Let's get which farms they are. It might help us. Sure. Ruth, I saw your hand was up. Do you want to yeah, respond to the question? Yeah, I just want to question? say, although we can't say for sure, I very much doubt that this is privately owned land uh, from private owners who want to give land to the state to redistribute it because they're concerned about expropriation without compensation. Firstly, mm -hmm. in many cases, people who've tried to donate land for land reform purposes have struggled for more than a decade to try and get the state to take it. Secondly, um, if it were to be donated, it wouldn't become state land and then be made available, it would have um, it, it would have been earmarked already. So I very much doubt that this is new donated land. This is old state land. This is old state land with a, with a long and complex history that we need to know about. Um, I think that there's also, you know, obviously the point of timing that many people have raised, which is why this suddenly now and why this mm -hmm. after years of people saying we're dissatisfied with policy. It's not an issue only of corruption. Uh, it's that our entire market based approach is means that a farm gets available here, a farm gets available there, there's no clarity. I mean, there's the whole system is, is, is sort of back to front in the sense, because it doesn't take people's need for land as the starting point. Uh, so I see that, that in a way, although this is a large amount of land and people might be pleased and maybe think that this is an important opportunity, uh, we haven't done the reframing yet. Uh, and that's the point I would make. Okay, um, do we have another question? Um, from the audience, Siane Mulepo is asking, what is the real motive behind the sudden release of state land? Do you guys want to uh, discuss that? I'm speculating. Mm -hmm. um, but if it is the farms where we, we're thinking of, the ones that were not consolidated, perhaps the people who are on those farms are beginning to make serious claims against the state. 
to say we've been here since maybe the 1980s and um, we've built, you know, lives here, um, livelihoods, and we want to be able to own the farms. Because sometimes, mm. sadly, politics takes precedence over people's needs and human rights. So it could be that there's pressure, serious pressure from people on the land. And this is one way to silence people because you simply now publicly advertise the farms that they've been using. Sometimes mm -hmm. they were leasing with documents, you know, there's a record, but they may not have been. And over the years, it was just understood that this is Gatlejo's, um land and whoever else is there. And, you know, it's known that you're the land users, the land owners, but not legally. So that might be one thing. In an, I mean, in addition to next year, this time, it's easy when people are campaigning to refer us to 2020 to say, by the way, we released 700,000 hectares, you know. That's my mm -hmm. question or thinking. Ruth, do you want to add? You know, I was thinking that, yeah, um, I think that for as long as land reform isn't actually central to our thinking about, about the economy, um, it tends to be um, merely a, a sort of a, a political game of numbers. How many hectares? You know, are we are we are we dishing out something? Smarties, political smarties, whatever kind of smarties. But I think that you know what is clear is that um, is that there isn't an overarching plan here. There is no plan, and there's a mismatch between the nature of demand for land, which is, as we know from research, from engagements, from whatever civil society says, is that the, the massive demand for land is for small, well-located parcels of land with access to water, proximity to roads, and particularly um, um, not too far off from towns. You know, that's where the big demand for land is. But this is another supply side measure. So, so my right. sense is that's missing. But the one issue that I haven't, that I don't feel we've actually adequately talked about is, is the tenure issue. So the state land lease and disposal policy, which, uh, which came in initially in 2013, and as you know, it's been revised over time, is the framework for government to decide how it's going to lease out its land. Um, now, the Auditor General has given qualified audits for several years running because the state cannot manage its own land and the leaseholds that it's meant to have. Um, when I did research with um, former colleague uh, Tembela Kepe several years ago in the Eastern Cape in one district, we could not find a land reform project where there was a lease. So, um, so there is this uh, model which is now not just short-term leases but 30-year leases. People are actually going to have to, those who manage through this application process to get access to the land, will have to pay a rent to the state. They will become tenants of the state and they will pay rent for 30 years and after that it be evaluated potentially for another 20-year renewal and after 50 years be eligible on some basis, to become the owner or to purchase, it's unclear. So, you mm -hmm. know, this is a 50-year leasehold model. Uh, it's not free. Um, there are different methods of approaching the rental. It was meant to be 5% of net turnover. Uh, initially, now, um, the minister last week said it will be set at a certain price per hectare per district. So, you know, this has a long history, uh, this idea that uh, in South Africa that black people must either be on land as... Um, as people who are uh, citizen, as citizens, uh, as individual emerging commercial farmers who are tenants of government. This is the model that we've had and was mm -hmm. established through the Homeland Consolidation, or they must be subjects under chiefly control, but it's one or the other. Um, so I think that uh, there is a big question about the tenure model um, that I would hope that uh, rural people themselves are going to say, here's how we see democratic land governance, which is why we should learn from the communal areas. Absolutely. Um, may we please have the next question up? Okay. Our next question is from Pilan Zamchia, and he is asking, should beneficiaries be forced to go for agricultural training as the state proposes? I think it is a, a, a positive um, intervention because what has happened previously 
was you would find the beneficiaries were sometimes just a group. So to meet the target of women, they would arrive officials on a farm, gather the women farm workers. Next thing they know, through a few weeks, they've registered a legal entity. Now they are allegedly either co-owners or leasing this farm. But what happens? They are still reporting to the same farm manager. That same white man typically is telling them what to do, where we purchase. Um, the whole, he's controlling the entire value chain, né? except now his title has changed and he's the strategic uh, partner or the mentor. So the training that's being proposed is not a negative thing. It could actually mean that it's meaningful uh, process for redistribution because you mustn't just gather people. They used to do this years ago, even with youth. You would find all over mm -hmm. youth were being told, you must form a co-op. If you want land, you must form a co-op. Youth did it in big numbers. They were struggling, like Ruth is saying, to get those even smaller parcels that they knew they could use effectively. So training isn't a bad thing because it's taking someone through the entire business of agriculture. So I think it's a positive um, step and it would somehow give us that um, equity that was missing so far from redistribution. Mm -hmm. And Ruth, your take on training? Um, okay, I'm sorry. One concern. Okay, sure. I can hear you now. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I think the training focuses on the fact that there's a need for change in the individual. Whereas I think that what a lot of our experience with land reform and its often disappointing outcomes and the fact that we've, in a sense, it's underperformed, could have achieved so much more. Redistributing land could have made a much more significant change, change to um, people's livelihoods, to local economies, to class relations. Um, and why hasn't it? It's largely not been through the, the absence of skills of individuals. I think that we have a wider structural problem. So I'd be much more excited, frankly, if we were told that agricultural training colleges were going to get a major boost rather than saying individuals will be sent for uh, for training. So I think that what we're needing to shift away from is, is being distracted by sort of, uh, in a sense, a paternalistic state saying, we will make sure that you're good enough to hold this land. Well, people who own privately owned land aren't forced to go for training. Why should anyone? <laughs> um, you know, rather, I think that the question is, what are the wider shifts? And in a sense... Uh, we're in a moment of great fiscal squeeze. It's not like the state has many smarties to give. Um, you know, so uh, what we want to see is is investment in uh, in institutions, in economic opportunities that's wider than just saying individuals will be sent for training. And I think that, that that's one of the big lessons of the past few years. Absolutely. Um, we only have like eight minutes left. May we please have another? A question up. So our next question is from Constance Mohale, and she's asking, is there any evaluation of what went wrong with the programs such as LRAD and uh, the proactive and proactive land acquisition strategy to avoid repeating the same mistakes? So basically, she's asking, was there any evaluation? Were there any studies that evaluated the problems of LRAD to not be repeated uh, with the current proactive land acquisition strategy? There are many. Um, there are many, um, and uh, some have been done by government, very few actually by government, uh, but there have been some, uh, uh, by the Department of Performance Monitoring and Evaluation, Department of Rural Development and Land Reform, now changed name, um, uh, by PLAS, by other research institutes. Um, and I think that one useful summary is, in fact, uh, the high-level panel report for Parliament, the Motlante Report of 2017, uh, probably less so the Presidential Advisory Report of 2019, but both sort of capture many of the lessons. Uh, there hasn't been clear targeting. There's been no area-based planning strategy, which, by the way, was one of the key 
uh, agreements at the 2005 National Land Summit is that rather than uh, just acquiring and transferring land, the purpose was to integrate thinking and planning and, uh, and starting with needs. Uh, and then looking for the land to meet specific needs. Um, the failure to subdivide farms, the failure actually to give any effect to, um, to the principles of the idea of agrarian reform, wider mm -hmm. economic changes beyond transferring land. So I think that there are many, but I want to just um, highlight perhaps again, this idea, and you can go to the parliament's website, look under the high level panel, there is an illustrative bill you know, an, a, a, a proposed piece of draft legislation that the Modlante panel produced and said, if we want to take Section 25.5 of the Constitution seriously, the fact that every citizen has a right of access to land on an equitable basis, this is a right, just like mm -hmm. restitution is a right. It's a right that has never had any teeth. Um, and what if we were to say every citizen can put up their hand and say, I need land, I want land, you have to respond to my demand for land. That would change the dynamic. Um, and so I think that that would be one of the one of the important ways forward. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth, and to you, Tebo, for um, this very exciting um, webinar on land redistribution. Currently, um, you know, making waves um, as everybody is excited about the land that will be redistributed. There are so many questions that I know that our viewers, including myself, have um, regarding this. But then I guess the take home message here is that um, it is imperative to note that the government is talking about re the redistribution of land in isolation, you know, so they're not considering that we do need uh, the rural also needs land for housing, etc. And it's not just only about agricultural land. And um, we should continue to probe these questions to the, to the ministry and ask them as to, you know, what happened to those um, submissions that we've made uh, early in the year? Have they been considered and so forth? We should not also be talking about what the government put on the table, but also consider where uh, the demand is for more land. I thank you both for this wonderful webinar. And I thank you all of our, our, our viewers for tuning in. Um, but before we go, we have a short um, announcement, Ruth, about our webinar next week. Would you like to get ahead? Okay. Um, thanks so much, Katlejo. Just to say that um, next Friday, uh, we'll be co-hosting Class Together with the Center of Excellence in Food Security and the C19 People's Coalition Food Working Group. We'll be uh, co-hosting a two-hour event, not a one-way webinar like this, uh, but an interactive social dialogue on the right to food uh, and equitable food systems. And that will be from 12 till 2 o'clock Central African time. Uh, Friday the 16th of uh, October, World Food Day, uh, with speakers from uh, Latin America, India, other parts of Africa, and with, in the last hour of that event, a particular South African focus. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. See you again next week. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Katlejo. Thanks, Katlejo.